This is Gene Montrestelli, and welcome to the Tapping Q&A podcast recorded live to tape from Williamsburg in Brooklyn. This is episode 505, originally aired March 31st, 2021. Hi, everyone. I hope this finds you well wherever you are and whatever time of day you're getting a chance to listen to this. Thanks for spending some time with me today. Today, I'm going to share with you three tapping techniques which have been lost to time. They've kind of fallen out of favor, but I use them regularly, and I think you should be using them regularly as well. And so I'm going to explain to you what they are, why they are valuable, and give you a little history as to why they have disappeared. And as you hear that, I think you're going to be in a circumstance where you recognize that they are valuable and they should be brought back. Before we do that, um, just a quick thank you to all of the supporters of the Tapping Q&A podcast. Because of their voluntary support every single week, you receive this high-quality content that makes it easier for you to get more out of your tapping. Those supporters receive bonuses for their support levels, as well as unannounced bonuses where I give them some really cool stuff. If you would like to be a supporter of the podcast, feel good that you're making it possible for other folks to experience this and receive some of those bonuses. All you need to do is go to tappingqna.com slash support. That's tappingqna.com slash support. I would like to share with you today three ways of tapping, which either you were not introduced to or you were introduced to them a long time ago and they have just kind of fallen out of favor. Um, We are multiple decades now into using the modern version of what we would call tapping. And because that is the case, we have new people joining the fold all of the time, bringing their own experience. It is something that is constantly evolving and changing. And part of that is also because it is so easy to do that trying something new costs you 60 to 90 seconds, and so we're able to innovate very, very quickly. But because things are changing and innovating, and because we are teaching more and more people, a number of the things that were originally around that I still think are super useful have fallen by the wayside. So I'm going to share three of those with you today. The first is tap on all of the points. And what I mean by this is over the history of tapping, There have been 15 or 16, depending on the moment in history, tapping points. Now, most of you who are listening to this, probably when you were given an instruction in tapping, you would be using what we used to call the shortcut basic recipe, even though you might not realize it's a shortcut because it is the only way you were taught. And so for most people today, when they are introduced to tapping, Most of the time, they're introduced to the point on the side of the hand. Most of the time, they're introduced to the point on the top of the head. And then they're introduced to eyebrow, side of the eye, under the eye, under the nose, chin, collarbone, and under the arm. Now, when I was, this time last year, working on the book that never was, one of my charges was to write a chapter on the history of tapping because I was introducing it to a new audience. And one of the questions was explain the tapping points and why we use them. And that feels like a straightforward question until you start diving in. Originally, when Roger Callahan was developing thought field therapy, which is the modern basis of the tapping that most of us do, he decided to use the endpoint of all of the meridian channels. And so for him, there were 15 points in doing that. As the, but choosing the end point was not something as easy as you might think. I mean, the idea was if we use the end point, the energy will travel the entire length of the meridian and it will be good and useful. But the eyebrow point, which we use, is not actually the end of that particular meridian channel. The end of that particular meridian channel is the inside of the bridge of the nose. If you're wearing glasses, it's the places that your glasses are resting. And from what I understand, Roger Callahan decided to use the eyebrow point instead of inside of the eye because he was afraid people would injure themselves and they would poke their own eyes out. And so he moved on to that second point, the eyebrow point. And so immediately you can see some evolution and changing happening as we work through it. Another spot that is used regularly, and from my understanding the way it came about, is something that is called the liver spot. And the liver spot is one of my favorite tapping points. And that tapping point is 
on the edge of the rib cage, directly below the nipple. And so if you poke around in there, you might actually find a little bit of a tender spot inside of there. And I think it's a very useful and a very powerful spot. So we have the 15 points that Callahan had, the liver spot, which was added by Gary Craig because someone at one of his workshops said, hey, this might be really useful, and it got added in. Now we're up to 16 points. Now, you probably were not taught 16 points. And these are my theories why. Number one, the finger points disappeared very, very quickly just because... We're having someone trying to remember a bunch of things, and when we're teaching something, streamlining it to the points that are only on the body and not thinking about the finger points is something that is an easier thing to do, and it's an easier way to teach people. It's easier to draw pictures of where those tapping points are, because I can just draw a body. I have a really, really easy shorthand where it's almost a stick figure type thing that gets all of the points easily, which I've done on the back of bar napkins. And so the finger points disappeared from a sense of simplicity, of making things easier to do. And they're really, really useful. And obviously, if you've been tapping and you've had success, it's great. Like, it's awesome. Like, we only need to be doing the amount of work that is useful. But I've found by adding those finger points back in is something that is very, very powerful. So if you're unfamiliar with the finger points, if you look at the back of your hand, I'm holding up my left hand right now, and you can use that as well. As I hold out my left hand, my thumb is on the inside as I look at the back of my hand. So the tapping point on the fingers is nail bed height. So it is on the side of the finger, thumb side. So I'm looking at my index finger, thumb side, right at the base of my nail bed on the side. It's almost like there's a little divot in there. That is the tapping point. And so those points are on all five of the fingers. Oftentimes when it was originally taught, the ring finger was not used because of the triple warmer point on the back of the hand, but I find it easier to use all five points when doing that. So add the finger points back in, it's useful. The other spot, the liver spot, I think the liver spot fell out of favor for two reasons. One, think about the description that I just gave you. It is on the edge of the rib, directly below the nipple. And that is a perfectly good description of it. And I'm sure some people felt uncomfortable teaching that. And because of the nature of some people's physiology, we actually have to move the breast out of the way to get down there to the edge of the collar, uh, edge of the rib bone. And so I can see how in teaching that in a group setting, how that might be uncomfortable for people to have to teach and have to experience. So again, it makes sense that both that point disappeared. Finger points disappeared for simplicity. Liver spot disappeared because it was a little embarrassing to share it. And so I would encourage you when tapping, bring all of the points back. That after you get under the arm, hit the liver spot, then move on to the finger points, and then go back to the top of the head if you're tapping in a regular order, you will find that your results are a little better by doing that. The second tool that I really, really like to use is the collarbone eye roll. And the way that you do the collarbone eye roll, and again, I think this fell out of favor because it's just complicated. And the more complicated something is when we're teaching it, the less believable it is. And so I love the simplicity of the shortcut recipe when teaching it to someone. But this particular piece is really useful. And so the way that you do a collarbone eye roll is you start tapping on the collarbone and you keep tapping on the collarbone the entire time we do the process. Then what we're going to do with our eyes, stealing a little bit from EMDR, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to hold your head straight with your eyes open, and you're going to roll your eyes from floor to ceiling, kind of like you're watching a balloon go up into the air. So you do that three times. You keep tapping on the collarbone. Then what you do is you spin your eyes three times open clockwise, three times while they're open counterclockwise. And the last thing you do while tapping on the collarbone, looking straight ahead, imagine that you're watching a tennis match, but you're not moving your head. You're only moving your eyes to follow the ball and you're zipping back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And again, you do that three or four times. So the way that I apply this is I find this to be super, super useful When we have an issue that is on a sud scale, two or less, so zero to 10, how big is the intensity, and it's two or less, 
or if we're in a circumstance where there's kind of a shadow of it, where we can't rate it, but we know that it is there. So the way that we use this is we do it in three parts. Number one, I instruct my clients, start tapping on your collarbone and don't stop tapping on your collarbone until I tell you to stop. Number two, I want you to tune into that issue that we just have that little remnant of. Now, roll your eyes floor to ceiling. Keep tuning into the issue. Keep tapping on your collarbone. Rotate your eyes clockwise three times, counterclockwise three times. Keep tuning into the issue. Keep tapping on the collarbone. Keep your head straight and zip your eyes back and forth like you're watching a tennis match. And I find doing this collarbone eye roll to be super, super helpful, like I said, in just kind of snuffing out the embers of something that is just hanging out there. And I love doing this because before we do this, my clients are aware there's something there, but they're not exactly sure what it is. After we do it, they're like, oh, it's gone. And so it is a big enough difference and the relief is large enough that even when they can't define it before, they can recognize the fact that it's gone after. And that is super, super useful because when something feels like a shadow, it's really easy to go, oh, it's not that big of a deal. It's barely gone. I love snuffing it out. I think about it like just like the embers after the fire has gone out. This is the opportunity to douse all the embers. There's nothing left there. So it's impossible for that flame to recatch if fuel shows up again. The third point that I really like is oftentimes referred to as the gamut spot. And the reason why it's referred to as the gamut spot is there used to be a whole procedure that went along with it. Um, The place on your hand that it is located is if you look at the back of your hand, it is if you extended your pinky finger and your ring finger, those bones all the way to your wrist, that you can actually feel the finger bones in the back of the hand, that there's a little valley between those. So you're in the valley between the pinky and the ring finger on the back of the hand. This is often referred to as the triple warmer in acupuncture. It has been found that if you tap on this point at the end of a session, you are much more likely to have the results that you have been working on to stick for a longer period of time. So it's not just a temporary relief, but it is something that sneak seeks in deeper. And so one of the things that I like to do at the end of the session when I'm tapping on my own is take 30 seconds, tap on the back of that point there on the, the, gam- the gamut spot in the back of the hand, and just n- take nice, easy, deep breaths and just think through all of the work that I've done today in this tapping session. Think through all of the new information that has come to mind. Think about the actions that I want to take and just take a few moments to just really set that in. Now, Even if tapping on that point does not actually set the transformation in in a better way, I find taking 60 to 90 seconds, two, three minutes at the end of a tapping session and just really thinking about the work that I've done and thinking about the actions that I want to take is a good way for me to recap the session. It's a good way for me to reaffirm how valuable the tapping is, which means I'm much more likely to do it. So even if the hypothesis that tapping on that spot is going to make this stick longer is not true, the fact that you're taking the time to do that particular thing is going to make a difference in your tapping sessions. Three really easy things that you can add to your tapping right away. Number one, use all the points, use the finger points, use the liver spot. It's a little longer to work through a round of tapping in that particular way, but it's worth spending an extra 20 seconds if it means that we're going to get a little further along. Number two, if you're in a situation where you have a suds level of two or less and you just want to snuff out those little embers, tap on the collarbone, roll your eyes in the fashion that I taught you. And number three, at the end of the session, take 90 seconds, take three minutes, take two minutes, review the work that you've been doing, review the insights you've had, and tap on that gamut point on the back of the hand just to set that transformation away that will be good and useful for you. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. I'd love to hear how you can, you know, what you are doing to apply these particular things, or if there are other things that you've picked up along the way that are away from the shortcut basic recipe that we could add to our tapping. Just because something is more complicated does not mean it's better, but just because something is simpler doesn't mean that we're getting the results that we want. So I would really encourage you to play with those, and I would love to hear your feedback. 
If you know someone in your life who is a tapper but does not know these three techniques, please pass it along. Don't spam your inbox, but there might be one or two people in your life who would really appreciate something like this. Please subscribe or follow the podcast depending on where you are. There's different words used. You can do it in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pandora, Spotify, Amazon Music, Audible. Wherever you get audio, just search Tapping Q&A, click follow, click subscribe, click whatever the button is, and more importantly, turn on those notifications so every single time a new episode comes out, you get a notification and you don't miss the goodness. If you have a question, a comment, a topic you'd like me to cover in the future, I would love to to hear from you, I can always be reached Gene, G-E-N-E, at tappingqa.com. If you're on the website, just click on that contact link. If you are in the free Tapping Q&A app, click on the contact link in the app. You can send me a voice memo or an email from right inside of the app as well. For the Tapping Q&A podcast, this is Gene Montristelli. I hope you have a great day, and I will talk to you real soon. Bye-bye. The Tapping Q&A podcast is copyright Gene Monteristelli Tapping Q&A. All views expressed by guests are those of the guests and not necessarily of Gene Monteristelli and Tapping Q&A.